All right, so we have one more presenter today, last but not least, right, Dr. Murph? Um, and I love the smile, yep. Um, so Dr. Sharon Murph uh, has spent nearly 40 years working in the field of nursing in various capacities. She has worked in a medical surgical nursing, uh, surgical intensive care unit, coronary care unit, the heart transplantation unit, home health, geriatrics, case management, nursing educator for 27 years, and as a consultant to nursing administrators in psychiatric and in mental health. Dr. Murph is a associate professor and a councilman, Joe Shine Endowed Professor at Grambling State University's graduate nursing program, where she has served as the coordinator for the nursing educator program for the past seven years. Dr. Murph's research interests include stress and health, the immune and inflammatory response, autoimmune diseases, diabetes, heart disease, lung diseases, health literacy, depression and disease, health promotion and disease prevention, religion and health, and college student success. I would just say that it sounds like Dr. Murph, you have done it all. And that sums it up in one little sentence. The floor is yours. You have 25 minutes and I'll let you know when that 25 minutes is up. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Silva for uh, that introduction. And I'm going to try to just go fast because I want to get to the end. That's a little case study, just a little short case study. But the title of the presentation is Body Under Siege, the Impact of Stress on Major Body Systems. And I know stress has been researched for eons of years, but I just personally don't think enough emphasis is placed on how stress affects us and then how to cope with uh, the various stressors. So the objectives for this presentation, by the end of this presentation, the presenter will be able to provide a definition of stress, determine various physiological and psychological stressors, discuss the stress response, and that is brief because it's very complex, and, and summarize how stress affects the major body systems. So stress is, has been described as a physiological or psychological condition that causes the person to experience some sort of strain. And Lazarus and Folkman they're kind of like um, after runners of Hans Selye and uh, Holmes and Ray. They have come up with the terms hassles and uplifts, daily hassles and uplifts. So, <clears throat> you know, we experience stress on a daily basis and sometimes, of course, all during the day. Stressors are a component of stress. They are tension producing forces that can be positive or negative, and they have the potential to produce both positive or negative outcomes. Hans Selye suggested that, and this was back in 76, Holmes and Ray were um, researchers before Selye, they were like around 1967, but Selye suggested that normal life experiences produce stress. There, there are a set of physiological reactions that occur in response to environmental demands or noxious stimuli, and those are stressors. Like I said, they can be pleasant or unpleasant, something that makes you happy, something that makes you sad, and they can have both positive and negative uh, outcomes. Unpleasant stress is um, the most damaging to the body, especially when it's of a chronic nature. And this is called distress, as we all know. And of course, eustress is described as those pleasant experiences, things that make us happy, things that make us feel joy, um, things that are positive and satisfying. <clears throat> 
So these are just a few of the physiological stressors. Um, if we had a few minutes, you know, I know we could make this list five times the length it is, but surgery, be it mine or major surgery, dental procedures, acute or chronic illness, something such as a cold, the flu, COVID-19, all different types of illnesses, trauma. Think about carpooling with children. Uh, probably all of us have had uh, some sort of experience like that. Um, taking a bunch of seven, eight, nine-year-olds or a bunch of teenagers, <laughs> carrying them around to different activities. Think about it. Um, meal preparation after you have worked anywhere from four to 16 hours in a day and you have been totally stressed out whatever you were doing whether it was education whether it was at the bedside uh bedside education or whatever then you come home and you have all these faces looking at you what's for dinner <laughs> That's stress, okay. Then think about a person with a chronic illness such as diabetes, all the things that uh, they experience in a day's time, planning a wedding. Now that's something that uh, can be and should be something very pleasant and positive, something that gives you joy and happiness, but let's face it, planning a wedding is stressful. And even if you are just a participant in the wedding, you still experience a lot of stress. Birth of a child can be pleasant or unpleasant. A few of the psychological stressors include anxiety, depression, death of a loved one, separation, divorce, which can lead us to depression, role strain. Uh, I heard uh, someone say their parents used to be hard workers and, you know, just the breadwinner for the day. But now in the latter portion of life, there's, you know, no, they're no longer, they're changing roles, okay? Uh, think about maybe yourself. Um, perhaps 20 years ago, 40 years ago, you know, the role was different. And now 40 years later, you have to look at, okay, where am I going? What am I doing? My role is totally different. The goals in life, totally different from what they were 30, 40 years ago. To understand a lot of uh, what stress does to the body, we need to really understand the stress response. And this is probably just a review for 99% um, of us, but the stress response is very, um, complex is multidimensional and it begins with the activation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis the hba when a person perceives stress the central nervous system is stimulated and the hypothalamus releases that corticotropin releasing hormone and crh connects to specific receptors that are embedded in the master gland, the pituitary gland. So CRH combines with those receptors and voila, we have a release of adrenal corticotropic hormone or ACTH from the anterior pituitary gland. It's released into the circulation. ACTH then binds to specific receptors on those adrenal glands, one set on top of the kidneys. And then I like to say it kind of goes downhill from there. <laughs> when uh, the adrenal glands are stimulated, you have that 
glucocorticoid of cortisol that is released. And there are numerous um, uh, uses or cortisol does a lot of things. So cortisol secretion breaks down protein and fat. It prevents the utilization of glucose thereby causing an increase in blood glucose levels. And then it prevents the effective functioning of the immune system. Cortisol causes an increase in the blood pressure and an increase in cardiac output. The corticotropin releasing hormone also causes a release of that dreaded antidiuretic hormone, ADH, from the posterior pituitary that causes the dreaded uh, retention of sodium and water. You see how we're just spiraling downhill. Then we have the sympathetic nervous system that causes the release of the catecholamines, epinephrine, norepinephrine from the adrenal medulla, adrenal medulla, excuse me, epinephrine increases the heart rate. Epinephrine primarily works on the heart. It does, it does work on blood pressure too, but most of uh, its innervation effect is on the heart. So it increases the heart rate. It increases the force of contraction of the heart. So you have a stronger contraction. Then we know that norepinephrine causes an increase in the blood pressure, increase in sweat production, causes pituit, oh, excuse me, pupillary dilation, and then pilo erection, better known as goosebumps that we experience when we have that fight or flight situation. Like I said, it, stress is a complex process and it causes dysfunction of the immune system. Releases, uh, uh, you have a release of histamines from mast cells and then it results in what? Acute inflammation. Inflammation can be chronic too. And then, of course, histamine is responsible for allergic responses. Then there are, there are numerous other chemical mediators. I just list a few of them here. Interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, which are, have been linked to obesity and type 2 diabetes. So here again, these chemical mediators further exacerbate the inflammatory process. So system under siege, I don't have all of the systems listed, but um, this is just a little snippet, so to speak. So take a person with diabetes. Diabetes is very complex and of course, you know, the person who is a diabetic has a lot of things they have to do in the run of a day. Uh, they experience much distress. And Young and Hyman says people with diabetes have more comorbid psychological conditions, such as depression, hyperglycemia hypoglycemia or altered glucose metabolism can lead to those peripheral neuropathies in the limbs. And <clears throat> if it's not managed uh, properly and early enough, you have the limb amputations. So hyperglycemia weakens the immune system. Then you add oral medications if a person is on those medications and you have the, the various potential side effects, adverse effects. What if a person's on insulin and they're insulin dependent? Well, what if they have inflammation? They may be placed on steroids to improve the immune response. 
well, we all know what the steroids do. They make you gain, well, they don't make you eat, but <laughs> you have an insatiable appetite. You eat more, you become, you gain more weight, you retain more uh, sodium and fluid, and the blood glucose goes through the roof. It goes much, much higher. The cardiovascular system, as we said, um, the epinephrine increases the heart rate. You have an increase in contractile force and cardiac output. Uh, norepinephrine causes the increase in blood pressure. You have ADH being released, causing retention of more sodium and water, thereby increasing the blood pressure further. This puts a person at risk for um, car, uh, myocardial infarction, heart failure, and other problems. Now, I'd like to share in these next few minutes just a little uh, case scenario, I guess, of a 47-year-old African-American female who was married. She had a 16-year-old daughter, and anyone who has children or nieces, nephews, grandchildren, you know how, how the things that teenagers go through. We all went through those. I know at 16, I was kind of a little rebellious there. So that's stress in itself, okay? Uh, this young lady was a caregiver for her father, who was a diabetic, and he was a uh, bilateral amputee, required round-the-clock care. Caregiver for a mother who had end-stage renal disease and end-stage cardiac disease was on dialysis. So this, this individual had to coordinate the care for the mother, the father, the daughter, the husband. In addition, she was a registered nurse, or she is a registered nurse. At the time, she was working full time in the critical care areas. She was the major breadwinner for the family. Her husband did work, but her income was the major source for all the people living in the household. And to add injury to insult, this, this young lady was a graduate student working on her master's degree. So <clears throat> she had a comorbid conditions, her diagnosis, type two diabetes, she was insulin dependent, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, chronic bronchitis, and chronic GI problems. And probably you could say they were known as IBSC constipation, fever and chills. She had these on a regular basis. Now, <clears throat> we saw this young lady <clears throat> at the end of the year, but her problems began like in January or February, the height of cold and flu season. So every month, this young lady would have an exacerbation of chronic bronchitis. She would have extreme shortness of breath and dyspnea. And, and just stay with me. This started like January, okay? January to November. So all throughout the year, she was having these episodes of chronic bronchitis. She had audible wheezes. I mean, you, she just opened her mouth and you could just hear the crackles just popping like <laughs> gurgling it right out of her mouth. And then when you auscultate it, all lung fields, you can hear the wheezes and crackles and, um, <clears throat> you know, bronchi, whatever you want to call them. And as a result 
of the shortness of breath and dyspnea. She had problems with ambulation, could not walk 10 feet without being extremely short of breath and dyspneic and having extreme fatigue. Yet she continued to work full time, continued uh, being at the bedside, continued with um, clinical education. This, uh, her chronic problems impacted her activities of daily living and impacted work, although she continued to do it, even though uh, you know, she was having the problem. So finally, remember I said it started in January. Uh, in November of that same year, she was hospitalized. I don't have all of her diagnostic um, uh, lab work, but I do know that her arterial blood gases, the PaO2 was 50% on admission. We know that it's supposed to be um, much higher than that. What is it, 85 to 100 or you know, 90 to 100%. Okay, so she had numerous diagnostic tests, blood cultures, urine cultures, sputum cultures. They didn't know what was going on. She had, uh, that should be chest x-rays. Okay, I see it have the abbreviation incorrect there, but that's a little typo. Chest x-rays, she also had a bronchoscopy, EKG, electrocardiogram. You, if you think of something else, she had that too, okay? She had numerous specialists on her case. Like I said, they just didn't know what was going on. She had all these pulmonary problems, but what was causing it? They were trying to figure out if we can find out what's causing the problem, then maybe we can get a handle on it. Her primary care physician, pulmonologist, cardiologist, infectious disease, critical care intensivists. She had two of those on her case rheumatology, um, anybody else, if you think of it, she had them too. So she came in, put her, of course, on oxygen therapy, nebulizer treatments every four hours, telemetry, intravenous infusions, and guess what? Steroids, mega, mega doses of steroids, so you know what that did to her blood sugar, to her immune system, to her weight gain. Uh, she was on antibiotics. She was on antiviral medications, antifungal medications, anti-inflammatory medications, and she ended up, I believe I have that spelled wrong, it's cytoxin. Uh, Imuran, and then Celsep, which you know are some strong, um, or uh, they can, some of them can be intravenous uh, chemo drugs as well as oral chemotherapy. Well, her bronchoscope, bronchoscope showed massive inflammation. In fact, the pulmonologist said the lungs look like two big, beefy, uh, um, beef lungs, just totally red and inflamed. She also had an open lung biopsy, and that surgery ended up with some chest tubes. And the, uh, the, um, the uh, specimen was sent to pathology. Pathology said, wow, all we see is inflammation. 
they sent a piece of her lungs to the Mayo Clinic, the famous Mayo Clinic. The results came back. There's no invading organism. All we see is massive inflammation. Massive inflammation, the final conclusion of at least three to four of the specialists was that this inflammation was related to stress and all the things that this young lady had to deal with. So just to uh, catapult further, she ended up with pulmonary fibrosis because uh, this process had been going on for a while. A diagnosis of Sjogren's syndrome, she had a mastoid gland biopsy, which um, confirmed the diagnosis of Sjogren's. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Sjogren's is an autoimmune disorder. And uh, to put it simply, it's like a second cousin to lupus. It can be primary or secondary. Also known, primary Sjogren's is also known as dry eye syndrome. But one of the sometimes fatal complications of Sjogren's is pulmonary involvement. This young lady ended up with a diagnosis because of the pulmonary fibrosis, pulmonary arterial hypertension, cardiac rhythm irregularities, peripheral edema, weakened immune system, and just a total body, um, all I can think of was just massively under siege by stress and the stress response. And here is that young lady 23 years later. Yes, that's me. And uh, I just gave you a, a short and virgin version of, of the situation, but stress, 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 it is true, stress can kill you. Hmm. Here are my references, references, references. And now I will entertain any questions or comments that you might have. Well, I, I wondered when you started down that path, if it was you, I, 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 had, I, I kind of wondered. And when you popped up with Sjogren's at the end, that's one my one of the diagnoses my sister has, and so it's one we've been dealing with. She has many on top of that, but it's one of the many. So I can appreciate your case study <laughs> immensely. Yes. How are you today? How do you feel today? I I feel good. I have good days and bad days, and I've been on cell set for many years, probably uh, 18 of the 20 years. Um, it's increased, I think I'm on 1700 milligrams a day now. And I have an insulin pump, I'm insulin dependent. But you know, the saying, I can't keep a good woman down. So I, could, I continue <laughs> to work and push through, you know, I don't know. Maybe this, I hope the stress doesn't kill me, but it's something that I enjoy doing. I love nursing. I love teaching and I just keep moving forward. I hear you. And that's sometimes that's what we need, just especially after hearing the speaker before you. If you don't have something that you're motivated and passionate about, you're no longer living. You're just existing. I don't want to go there. <laughs> And exactly. you don't want to go there either. I, I can tell. Right. Wow. wow. Yeah. And the the Sjogren's has affected my vocal cords. That's why I have this raspy uh, voice. Um, I, I used to sing. I used to 
just do a lot of things, but now it's impacted my my voice quality, but I'm forging forward. No, absolutely. One day at a time, right? Just keep moving forward. Right. Does anyone else have any questions or comments um, for our friend here? We've all hung in all day, the last two days together. She's our last presenter. Yes, Amit? Yes, yes. I appreciated uh, you sharing the fact that you were, you were willing to share about yourself um, at the end there. Thank you. Very much appreciated. Anyone else comments or thoughts? Well, I, I, I will add a few more then since no one else is coming up with any. Um, and my sister had POTS, if you've heard of POTS before post Postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome is one of the, again, one of the many things, but it was the first thing that showed up in her neurologist that finally knew what it was. Um, and only because she pushed and read and pushed because she's a nurse as well. And he said, stress, stress does this to people. Of all the patients I know, and you know, at the time she was working full time and in school full time and you know, had a husband and a son at home and he said, stress, we do this to ourselves. Yeah. You pretty much agreed with him and all that you said. Yes, yes. Find, find a way to balance the two. Cause I know I, I went into a, running a program for three years with no hypertension. But by the time I left that job, hypertension was a new piece of my life and it's not going away. <laughs> it's there to stay. Right. So stress is bad. It can be good and motivate us, but it, too much of it and, and not enough balance and it definitely can destroy us. Exactly. I, I just wanna say thank you to everybody for all you've brought. Um, the presentations today were fabulous. I've learned a lot. Um, so many things I wanna follow up on. I love to learn as someone else said during the, the day, love to learn, love new ideas. And y'all have brought lots um, to the uh, to the conference and, and to us. So I just want to say thank you.